One, two. Okay, let's start. Uh, so today we wanted to uh, present some uh, results of the performance testing of Hadoop on top of OpenStack. Uh, and I want to introduce uh, colleagues uh, presenting together with me. So Nikita is a software engineer at Mirantis, uh, running the Sahara team now and uh, working primarily on Sahara. Uh, Paul Work is an OpenStack software lab manager uh, at Intel, and I am principal engineer at Mirantis, uh, working on Sahara and XPTL Sahara project. So, uh, a few words about the agenda. We are going to uh, take a look a bit on a Sahara project in OpenStack, uh, on the performance lab setup and challenges that we got during the testing, the overview of the testing itself, and some conclusions. So. Uh, some disclaimer as always. Uh, first of all, uh, why to run Hadoop in the cloud? There are some pros and cons as always, and to the pros, we can uh, we can talk about a few items. First of all, it's a controlled infrastructure when you can do deploy uh, through the API, easily orchestrate different distributions of the data processing frameworks, uh, such as a Hadoop, Spark, and etc. You can use it for dynamic resource utilization, for example, to use the spikes uh, of the labs to enable additional data, data processing workloads. And thanks to the isolation in the cloud, you can run a multi-user and multi-tenant environments, uh, like to share the single Hadoop cluster between the tenants and the users, and enable uh, like mixed joint workloads on the... Um, the another plus of the using virtualized uh, environments in a cloud, you can run multi-version Hadoops on the same infrastructure with isolation on all levels, and uh, they will not uh, use uh, uh, resources for another cluster, for sure. And uh, there is like security additions by running, for example, them on different networks. So you can run uh, vanilla Hadoop, for example, Cloudera or Hortonworks distribution, or some other distributed frameworks on the same cloud. Uh, and uh, in addition to it, it helps you to share data across the cloud applications, because you have all of the data available through the same API uh, on, on, the, on the cloud. So, uh, as always, we have some drawbacks of using Hadoop in the cloud. The first of all is a performance overhead, and uh, uh, it's like very important because we're going to have overhead on a CPU and network for sure, uh, and uh, this overhead should be uh, captured as a, one of the cons for running Hadoop in the cloud. Uh, the scheduling became non-trivial when you're moving Hadoop to the cloud because you need to uh, still manage the affinity of the data to, uh, to the compute part and uh, you need to ensure that all of your data will not be stored on the same hardware node to enable the replication of HDFS, for example. And uh, of course, when you have a large number of VMs on a single physical node, it will create some additional performance overhead and uh, it will make the affinity case even, even more uh, complex. So, uh, there are already some existing solutions running Hadoop in the cloud. Uh, mostly all popular pub public clouds currently have something related to the big data and uh, specifically to the Hadoop part. So here we can see like likely the most popular of them, like AMR, Google Cloud Platform, with their Apache and Spark workloads and Azure. Uh, and uh, if we're going to take a look on the private clouds, to OpenStack specifically, we can use a Sahara project. Uh, it's an official OpenStack integrated project, enables data processing services, and uh, uh, data processing from frameworks provisioning. So using Sahara, you can provision uh, frameworks on top of OpenStack and enable the data processing API. Um, so you can choose a different uh, distributions of Hadoop and uh, other frameworks using Sahara uh, with their versions. The cluster topology could be specified as well. You can specify the cluster and not group templates through Sahara to enable different um, setups of set of processes to run on each role of the cluster. 
and you can specify any kind of the configurations uh, to all the processes you're running on a top of Hadoop cluster. So a few words about Sahara architecture. It's like a very complex picture, probably not clear at all. Uh, so in a few words, what's like the main points is that uh, Sahara provides a REST API. It's uh, backed by the keystone for authentication and uh, through Python Sahara client uh, and CLI, you, you can interact with Sahara. As well, we have uh, the Horizon dashboard, uh, the Sahara dashboard and the Horizon. It enables all the API functionality through uh, web UI. Uh, we have uh, integration with uh, different data sources such as uh, HDFS, Swift, and you can use Manila for the shared uh, file systems. So, uh, so here I'm using Heat as a provisioning engine for the underlying resources, and uh, that's like transparently uses Nova Glance, Cinder, Neutron, and other services to provision the underlying resources on top of OpenStack to run Hadoop cluster. Um, so I will switch to Fold. So about a year ago, uh, we were very interested in learning more about OpenStack and performance for some big data applications that our software developers were working on. And we partnered with Mirantis folks to set up this experiment project to demonstrate the functionality of Sahara and the performance possibilities with the direct block storage. To do this, we set up in one of our labs in Oregon, a small clustered environment with 12 identical servers, all connected through a 10 gigabit switch, which was then connected through a VPN appliance to the internet, which allowed the Mirandus folks to come in over the internet to perform their testing and experimentation. And it took us a little bit of a learning curve to get this set up and functioning normally, but after a short period, that was very successful for us. Each of these servers was configured identically with two of the Intel Xeon E5-2699 V3 processors. Uh, these are codenamed Haswell processors. Uh, each of these has 18 cores running at 2.3 gigahertz. Uh, we also configured these servers with 192 gigabyte of RAM in 12 16 gigabyte sticks. And they each had 24 SATA hard drives, standard one terabyte each, 7200 RPMs. Uh, in order to get maximum possible performance out of the hard drives, we set up each server with three RAID controllers set into pass-through mode. And then we also had one SSD boot drive, about 800 gigabyte size, and a dual port 10 gigabit, excuse me, 10 gigabit NIC on the motherboard. Uh, to communicate all this together, we used an Extreme Networks Summit switch, the X650 variety, and then the Comcast external uplink on an isolated network. And this preserved uh, security so that no one else could hack in, and the Mirantis folks also couldn't get into the rest of the Intel internal network. And with that, I'll turn the time over to Nikita to talk about their experiments and their results. Hey, thanks, Paul. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to briefly describe how the software stuff was running on this uh, service. So we had the Ubuntu-based uh, controller and compute nodes running Ubuntu 14.04. Uh, actually, the virtualization was backed by KM and KVM version 2, and the OpenStack distribution was uh, based on Mirantis OpenStack 6.8, which is the June release uh, of the upstream uh, branches. So, of course, during the testing, we have faced a few of the architectural challenges uh, that we needed to solve to reach the reasonable level of performance. Uh, I'd like to highlight the three of them, which was the CPU to RAM utilization on the virtual environment. Uh, so, we should keep the CPU and RAM uh, as much utilized as it is uh, on the hardware nodes while running Hadoop workload. Uh, we had to somehow solve the storage issue so that the Hadoop uh, daemons could read from directly those uh, 12 drives on the, uh, each compute host without network or other overhead. And of course, we had to tune the Hadoop distribution itself to uh, be able to maximize the utilization 
of both CPU, RAM, and network. So uh, the key to the proper CPU and RAM utilization are this uh, keeping the ratio persistent across your nodes. So uh, each VM should have the equal amount of uh, RAM to CPU core uh, to allow the yarn containers to be spawned uh, consistently. Then uh, what we've noticed is that the VM flavor is uh, really matters and you do not want to stack up a lot of small VMs on a huge compute host to generate affinity. And then the uh, actual affinity issue which could result in a data loss. So uh, the data nodes should be aware of where they are running or single compute host or on different compute hosts. So as for the utilizing the resources and keeping the balance, uh, well, there is no uh, single solution to how you should tune your OpenStack or Flavor. All the workloads are different, and uh, it's always true that adding CPU power will allow you to spawn more YAR containers and to run more uh, tasks in parallel. And uh, for workloads like uh, Spark streaming or MapReduce, that's usually the key. But for more balanced workloads, which you use also the I.O. and the, some caching, uh, you should need at least two gigabytes of RAM per vCPU core. So our final flavors had uh, 32 uh, virtual cores and 64 gigs of RAM for each uh, data node and yarn storage VM. Uh, as uh, the results show that um, uh, when running the KVM virtual machine, it will usually consume 5 to 20 percent more RAM than you allocate to your guest memory. So that again uh, gives us the hint that you should uh, try to avoid spawning smaller VMs, which are, of course allow more flexibility in your scheduling, but a uh, larger VM will give you less overhead and uh, you should never overcommit your resources while running heavy workloads. Otherwise, you're just going to end up with a race for the resources while not running the workload. Um, the typical anti-affinity use case is when uh, uh, you try to spin up the uh, Hadoop cluster with an HDFS service, and if you just leave the node with the standard, standard filters, it can easily allocate your VMs with uh, data nodes on the same compute host and uh, by default, the replication factor is set to three in HDFS. So once you lose the compute host number one, uh, and you, if you had the, all the three replicas on it, of course, you will lose the, some of the blocks. So Sahara doesn't allow the, to, this to happen, and it will always place the, at least one of the replicas outside of, on a different compute host, so outside of the first one. Next, uh, I'd like to cover some um, storage settings that we use to optimize the performance. Um, so the things we should uh, you should pay to attention while uh, setting up these uh, uh, workloads, Hadoop-like workloads for batch processing, is the locality of the, your storage devices. Because Hadoop was initially designed uh, in, with the locality in mind, and uh, the closer the device is to the data processing unit, like yarn container, the better the performance is. Of course, you should not forget the uh, reliability of this uh, uh, storage, so uh, replication and uh, backup is always a thing to be considered. And of course, the, from the operator's perspective, the ease of setup of, of the storage should not be forgotten because otherwise, uh, why should you go to the cloud if it's harder to set up than the hardware server? So as for the storage for the cloud, there are uh, three popular solution at the moment. So uh, we would categorize them into these uh, uh, areas like first one is the Ceph or actually any other distributed backend which is connected to the compute node via the network interface and uh, can uh, uh, store the data across the uh, Ceph cluster or any other clustering system that you use. The next one is the LVM partitions, uh, which are uh, can be dis stored locally and remotely, and those partitions are usually attached via the iSCSI protocol to the VM. And the last one will be, is the local device storage, which is uh, uh, the approach we, uh, that Cinder allows to have uh, attaching the real block device directly to virtual device of the VM. So. If you look at the diagram uh, shown these uh, three approaches, you can clearly see that 
in the first two cases, there are always a possibility that you're going to have the network interaction to read from the storage in Ceph and LVM, while the block device driver in Cinder will guarantee you that the uh, devices you're attached to the VM are always local to on the same compute host. There are always drawbacks for each of them, each of these approaches, but what I would like to point here is that uh, the block device driver, which was used for the testing, has no network traffic impact at all on the cloud, and it has no CPU impact on the compute host. So uh, the block, dri block device driver doesn't require any uh, iSCSI or LVM managers running. Of course, there are drawbacks like it doesn't support live migration and you cannot evacuate your uh, block device from the compute host or it doesn't allow a flexible uh, scaling, uh, scheduling, so the whole device is utilized all the time. So that was the uh, uh, OpenStack uh, configuration setup uh, required for the testing and now I'll just go through the, uh, what are the configurations uh, done to the Sahara part. Uh, first of all, we had to do a Hadoop distribution choice, and then once we have a Hadoop distribution, we need to set up the topology to deploy, and finally configure the locality and the services on the, uh, on the Hadoop distribution. As for uh, vendor choice, uh, Sahara supports a different uh, uh, vendors of Hadoop distributions, and we also have the vanilla plugin, which uh, uh, installs the upstream Hadoop uh, uh, package. Uh, for this testing, we were using a uh, Cloudjar Hadoop. Uh, the topology of our cluster was uh, basically the three node group templates uh, based on the role separation. So the smallest node group template was running the manager and it was used only on the provisioning phase. The master template was running all the Yarn and HDFS master process and Hive and Zookeeper to run other coordination stuff and the Hive queries. The, the rest of the cluster was occupied by the worker node groups, which were running node managers with data nodes, and those had the, only the local disk attached as the storage. So totally we had 12, uh, uh, 12 uh, worker VMs uh, grouped two on the compute host, so six compute hosts were completely utilized with the workers, and one was running the master VM and the VM, uh, manager VM with the ephemeral storage. So to sum up, the, uh, uh, the layout was the layout of the fla flavors looked like, as already said, 32 vCPUs for 64 gigs of RAM, and we used some extra root disk storage for the workers uh, for the temporary files, which are required by the YAR containers. All the drive, all the VMs were uh, had their swap disks disabled and were connected to the 10 gigabit internal network. Well, and the volumes are, were used only on the worker nodes. So the, uh, once the cluster is provisioned, the Hadoop configuration should be done to the Yarn and HDFS servers. And uh, it's always important to know that uh, any Hadoop distributions comes already configured with some default settings. And those default settings are pretty much uh, allowing you to run some uh, small tests and they are consistent and they are working, but they will never give you the best performance utilization of your cloud or bare metal, and please do not try to achieve the performance while running on the default uh, Hadoop distribution settings. So uh, I'd like to briefly go through the configuration settings we did for the Yarn service. Uh, here you can see that uh, there are actually two groups of configuration options. First one is related to MapReduce framework, and what it basically says is how many CPUs and how many gigabytes of RAM you can allocate to each map and reduce task. And then you also see that there are uh, similar configurations, but for the Yarn service, and those are telling the Yarn framework, which is a underlying framework under the MapReduce, that uh, how many gigabytes and cores should be allocated to the containers in which the map and reduce task run in. The optimizations for the HDFS were not so significant. We just increased the uh, uh, read ahead uh, parameter so that it could uh, cache more data while reading the data f into the memory. And uh, the block size for the testing was also significantly increased from 64 megabytes. So, uh, it will be 
used for the synthetic testing. So in different workloads, again, the setting may be different. We also disable the HDFS permissions just to ease the access to HDFS, but this is not a huge impact on the performance, and uh, this should be strictly considered for not running on the production with permissions disabled. So what did we use for testing? Well, we took the very standard uh, Hadoop uh, benchmark, which is TerraSort. It's a three-phase uh, synthetic benchmark, and uh, all of these three phases are putting some components under stress, but uh, first of all, of course, the, it is the uh, t uh, data generation step, which uh, uses a lot of describe operations, read, uh, writing some random 100-byte strings to the HDFS with uh, random values. Then the actual TerraSort benchmark comes into play when it uh, reads all the random values, splits them into chunks, then uh, sorts them by key, and in the entries with the same key sources by value. And after that, it stores them in a sorted fashion. All, of course, uh, replication of the output also comes into play, so there is a lot of network traffic being generated at this phase. And the last one is the validate, uh, uh, hash-based hash -based validation of the TerraSort, which you usually can just uh, put the disk read operation at stress. So now we're coming to the actual results of the review. So uh, basically, we did a few, uh, maybe a few tens or hundreds of runs for each of these benchmarks. And we, here are the one terabyte benchmark results collected for the virtual machines compared to the same setup on bare metal. So the bare metal uh, performance was about uh, 15 to 16 minutes sorting one terabyte, while the VMs were somewhere around 20 minutes. Uh, the same uh, test for the three terabytes uh, showed that uh, bare metal can complete it in under the 50 minutes, while VMs were uh, getting close to one hour in average. And well, judging by this simple uh, execution time of the benchmark, we can uh, just say that uh, in a balanced workload, the bare metal machines could complete it in 15 to 20 percent faster than VMs. But uh, this conclusion uh, makes more asks more questions than it gives answers. So uh, we collected some uh, CPU and other metrics to analyze for the future. So first of all, uh, the CPU utilization graph, which shows that. Uh, 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 the uh, both map and reduce phases look uh, quite similar on bare metal and the VM setup. Uh, this, there is a down uh, spike when the shuffle phase happens and there is not much uh, CPU power used when the data is transferred across the nodes. The RAM utilization uh, for the VMs and bare metal also uh, show that the phases pretty much uh, match up, but uh, the uh, bare metal nodes seem to utilize more RAM on each of the phase, even that taking into consideration that uh, running two VMs on the same node is not equal to running this single node on the, uh, the same stress test, it will still see that uh, VM is better utilized on bare metal. As for the network traffic, uh, we actually see the opposite picture that the VM tests uh, could generate a lot more uh, traffic across the cluster. On the middle phase, which is the shuffle phase of the MapReduce job, and uh, so looking at all of this, these three together, we just can uh, see that probably the CPU utilization was quite high in both cases, and it's not a bottleneck to this 20% uh, gap, but run consumption and significant network traffic are the areas that uh, need to be investigated further for the uh, bringing the VM performance closer to bare metal. So what are our conclusions so far for this uh, uh, comparison? First of all, the Sahara service and the OpenStack components proved to be uh, able to provision and run the Hadoop distribution properly on the virtualized environment. We could uh, fit in the VMs with the scheduler hints, with the regular scheduler hints, so no additional development was required for that. We could also 
where I also learned that uh, actually bringing the larger VMs with uh, more CPU cores and more RAM onto the uh, huge node gives the better performance and better utilization. And the Cinder and Nova APIs are just perfect for that. Uh, they also learned that the Cinder block device driver uh, could completely uh, remove the network overhead from the storage layer. And uh, it was also quite e uh, easy configurable on the compute host, so running the Cinder volume uh, process. So well, what is the next steps and what are we going to proceed is, uh, first of all, uh, the better tuning of uh, CPU disk and network should allow to close that 15 to 20 percent gap between bare metal and virtualized, so that we need to continue investigating on that. Uh, also, there is a, uh, ironic case when, uh, in some cases, uh, the installation to bare metal may be still an option, in, uh, even in the cloud environment with the ironic interfaces, but. At the moment, the user interfaces for Ironic and Sahar integrations are not that uh, good, so the UX improvements are, should be done. And the third case to investigate here is the hybrid approach when uh, part, part, of the part of the Hadoop cluster can be stored on bare metal and it can handle the long living data and the persistent data that shouldn't move a lot, while the workloads can run on the VM spawned uh, on the same hardware or on, on, on the nearby hardware to complete the burst to spiky workloads and then scale down to back to bare metal. So that's actually what I, we wanted to share about our scale testing and performance testing of uh, uh, virtualized Hadoop environments. So please, if any questions, you're welcome. Just a very quick question. Uh, I mean, did you guys look at why the RAM utilization didn't go up with the VMs? Okay, so uh, what we think could cause this uh, uh, RAM utilization on uh, uh, hardware nodes is that the Java garbage collection works uh, slightly different on the huge amounts of VMs. So uh, the node manager daemon was running on 64 gigabytes in virtualized and on 128 gigs on hardware. So that might cause the uh, difference in consumption. Uh, probably the caching system is also behaving differently on these huge amounts of RAM. So it's very hard to trace whether the consumption goes actually into the uh, yarn containers themselves or into my produced tasks. So uh, that may be the difference. Did you try any flavors larger than the 32 gigabyte? All the way up to like one to one ratio with the host? Uh, well, we didn't try to launch one VM per host, but uh, when trying to launch larger VMs, we saw that uh, this, um, uh, this difference between the guest VM uh, RAM size and the actual RAM that is used by the process in the host system, it actually grows. So the more, uh, the, be the bigger the flavor is, the more RAM is somewhere wasted between the hypervisor and the host operating system. So. I guess we will not be able just to spawn one VM the size of the host at some point. Another question. Um, when you spawn multiple VMs on your uh, physical host, did you divvy up the block devices? How exactly were the block devices scheduled to the multiple VMs running on that host? Okay, so there is um, an instance locality filter, which is part of the Cinder backend. And uh, so the, while spawning the instance, the VM appears first. And then when you create a volume, you can just tell them run this volume on the same host as the instance. So, by, uh, so the Cinder volume will uh, run this, uh, will 
create the volume, which actually is just the mapping to the real block device, like def sda or def sdb, and then uh, while attaching, you, you just uh, specify the cinder. Uh, uh, you just point the over to the cinder device and it will attach it to the iSCSI bus. So it will not use any, uh, it will attach it to Vertio bus. It will not use any iSCSI or anything if cinder doesn't. So you directly hooked up a certain number of, so yes. how, how many block devices per VM was that? We had 12 per VM. Okay, thank you. Uh, the you know the 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 three copies of uh, so how, how did you do the third VM on a separate host? How did you make sure like that, that was consistently you know uh, applied across your cluster? Uh, to handle that, you can uh, specify the now you need to use Nova filters, and it ho it is called the uh, well there are actually two approaches to that. First one you can uh, say run on a different host from the other VM. So if you spawn them sequentially, you can just say run the first VM anywhere you want, then the second VM on another place then rather than the first one, and the third one on anything else run rather than first and second. But that's a very slow approach, and the faster th approach is to use the uh, hidden, uh, hidden uh, resource groups uh, with the affinity filter that will allow you just to uh, give you a number of uh, nodes you, you can allow to have on a single host, and then it will distribute it with the Nova scheduler. Okay, so if there is no more questions, I think we can close this talk. Thank you.